we're right back again. We're still sitting in the same seats. We haven't really left, and I'm right there. There's Robert over here on my left, and uh, I'm on his his left as well, or his right. I can't tell because the, 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 the cameras change everything around. But good to have you back here, Robert. It's so good. I, I just asked you to to do this just yesterday if you'd uh, or just a few days ago if you would uh, do a few episodes one or two episodes just on what has happened there in saudi arabia on august the 18th with neymar wearing the cross and the indignation that that caused around the muslim world interestingly it did not cause indignation in Saudi Arabia itself. In fact, I don't hear any reports coming out of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabians are actually angered by this reaction by the others. There seems to be a disconnect going on here. Uh, and some of that, I think, has to do with what Saudi Arabia is trying to do. There is a movement happening in Saudi Arabia, possibly pushed more so by MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the, the ruler, the de facto ruler, as you said in the last episode of Saudi Arabia, to liberalize or to ameliorate Saudi Arabia for the rest of the world, which goes completely against the reaction of this cross that Neymar was wearing there at the airport, the reaction by the Muslims around the world. Can you can you expand on this? What I want you to do, and you, you, you're, you've got such a good mind, you have so many great anecdotes, and you're able to really interpret Islam better than anybody else I know on this planet. But one of the things that is curious for all of us is, what in the world is going on in Saudi Arabia? Why did this cross offend others in Saudi Arabia, especially the officials or people who are under the authority of MBS? What do you think is happening here? Well, MBS is trying to do something that is extraordinarily difficult. He sees the writing on the wall in terms of oil. The Saudis have become fantastically rich on the basis of selling oil to the rest of the world. But now the leaders of Western Europe and North America are saying, we're going to free our economies from oil and go electric and various things. Who knows how realistic this is going to be? proved to be and what uh, form it will take. But MBS is trying to stay ahead of the situation and transform the Saudi economy so that the Saudis remain fantastically wealthy while not depending on oil. And so in doing that, as you noted in the last episode, he's uh, buying up various uh, entertainment industries, the whole professional golf uh, phenomenon, whatever form that takes, the PGA Tour and all that, it's under Saudi auspices now, and he's bought other things as well, and he's building this fantastic new, uh, It's is it even valid to call it a city? It's much more than a city, a, a huge economic complex where all the sorts of wonderful things are projected to happen. But the thing is that he realizes that if he's going to do all this successfully, he has to change Saudi Arabia fundamentally, mm -hmm. because you go to Western Europe, you go to the United before, States. Before you get into this, let's just talk about these three er these two areas, especially. Let's unpack it. So, and I'm going to put some pictures up. So um, Robert, he, he, he's taken over. We pretty much know he's taken over PGA Golf now uh, with their own golf because they have brought in huge talent using enormous, exorbitant uh, salaries for these golfers. Uh, he has... Uh, the, the PGA has blinked and is now acquiesced to them. They're taking over Formula One. Uh, they want to make Formula One really be headquartered in Saudi Arabia. And then they're also doing something that is even mu much on a grander scale called the Neom Project, which is a set, uh, a set of pods, city pods, that extend from the Gulf of Aqaba all the way to Tabuk. I understand it's about 110 miles, and these pods are going to be in fact, they're being built as we speak. Uh, they will be finished by 2030. And the, the city of Aqaba itself is going to be a state-of-the-art city with its own moon. And it's going to have flying cars. Uh, the Neon Project is going to have three levels. It's going to have a high-speed rail. 
that goes, I don't know, it takes only about an hour or a few hours to go that whole length. And as it stops, it's down underground. The lower is where the transportation, the next level that's still underground is where all the workers live and where they're all the work is being done. And uh, for the people who live on top, who will live in the upper higher, which is uh, actually in the uh, out on the surface. And that's where the researchers live. And that's where you're going to bring in the best researchers from around the world. Again, paying exorbitant salaries from all this oil money. What they want to do is they also want to make the four largest uh, universities in uh, in Saudi Arabia to be the great the the best universities in the world to be superior to Harvard and Yale and and Cambridge and Oxford. They want the the they want education to be funneled and started and headquartered there in Saudi Arabia. So they're hitting intellectual property. They're hitting the whole emergence of they want to take I, I, Silicon Valley and bring it to their Saudi Arabia. They want to have all research based in Saudi Arabia, and they want to have all sports based in Saudi Arabia to diversify. Introducing the new horizon for Riyadh, a new icon, the Mukab, the world's first immersive experiential destination. A gateway to another world. Step inside and it's unlike anything you've ever seen. At a scale that's unprecedented. Big enough to hold 20 Empire State Buildings. Where you and those around you enter a new reality. Transporting you to Mars one day and magical worlds the next. Where your retail experience is completely reimagined and hospitality, leisure, and entertainment reach new levels, all in breathtaking, ever-changing environments. This is the new face of Riyadh. Experience a new horizon. These are huge, enormous uh, projects, tens of billions hundreds of billions of dollars into the trillions of dollars because they have the money to do so. But in order to do that, there is a problem here. What's the problem? Go ahead, Robert. Explain what you see as the problem here. Well, as you noted, you know, you, you go to Harvard or Yale or you go to Silicon Valley. <clears throat> you don't see the women wearing the cabs. You don't see their faces covered. You don't see them in long flowing robes. You don't see people observing Islamic mores in extravagant detail. There are Muslims among the people there, and some of them are very observant, and some of them are not. But also you have a great preponderance of people who are not Muslim, have no interest in becoming Muslim, and are not disposed to respect the dictates of Sharia that Saudi Arabia up to now has prided itself on being the foremost exponent of in the world at large. So what is MBS going to do? On this, he has been very delicate. And, you know, we discussed this, I don't know if you remember, I think a, a, a year or two ago, we discussed his interview, a very fascinating, wide-ranging interview that he gave detailing all these wonderful plans. And the interview was very extensive, went on for a couple of hours. And in just one segment of it, he was asked about modernizing the religion and some vague statements he has made. They have to be vague of necessity uh, about rejecting weak hadith, which of course everybody ostensibly does already. That's the, the one of the problems with all this. But he's, what he's stating is that he can modernize Islam in Saudi Arabia and make it attractive for people from Silicon Valley and Harvard and Yale and all the rest to come and live in these new cities or Aqaba or wherever uh, by sweeping away customs and traditions that are not actually based on Islamic texts and teachings. The problem that he's got is that Let all of them. Let me just stop there. Yeah. 
uh, as you remember in that interview, he said, we are going to use as our constitution, the Quran and only the Quran and any traditions that confront the Quran, we're going to dispel with because Wahab himself would not have agreed with the way we have interpreted these traditions. So he used Wahab's name to support what he was saying from yeah. the 1700s. Uh, basically, what he was saying is we're going to be Quran only. Now, you've come across Quran only Muslims. I, You used to get them all the time at Speaker's Corner, and we would run circles around them. We would, they are so great to use because if you become Quran only, much of uh, many of the things, the things that you do on daily life get thrown out the window because you have to go to the traditions to know how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep. Everything you do in life 24 7 comes from the traditions. If you're going to say the Quran is your constitution, which says very little about how you're to act or how you're to dress or how, how you're to treat your wife or how you do any of these laws and rules and regulations that Muslims are absolutely dependent on, you've thrown away 80% of. His of Islamic tradition, that the yeah. hadith, the tafsir, the tahtik, and that and and of course the sirah, and you can see the incredulity of what he was saying in just that one interview, because all of us and you saw it, I saw it, everybody else who did, I Hatun did a, a, a series on this. I think I know Al Fadi and I did a whole. In fact, Al Fadi and I tried to do it, and he didn't want to do it because he's Saudi Arabia, and he said, "Jay, can we use another subject? I don't want to say anything because uh, I have family still in Saudi Arabia." So we had to downplay it with him. But it is absolutely incredulous what he said back then. To, yeah. it, he was saying we're going to only use this one book this one book without realizing that this one book not only says very little about how to live but there are so many problems with this one book that he has not even figured with and one of them is this like verses like chapter 9 verse 28 uh, that that we are all of us who are not muslims are unclean well how is he going to use that how is he going to use that in by bringing now how is that going to attract people to come and study there uh, at the neon project or in these it institutions? has implications it's not just a bare statement but the reaction assuredly from outside saudi but still the reaction to neymar's cross is an indication that people take that very seriously absolutely and so there are, and they may be being silent now, but there are millions of Muslims in Saudi Arabia who take that very seriously, and they're not going to be happy any more than Osama bin Laden was happy. You remember that in when he declared jihad against the United States in the 90s, he invoked as his first grievance that the unbelievers had trampled the sacred soil of Saudi Arabia and the Saudi government had permitted it. And there, these people are still there. There were many that agreed with him at that time, and there are many that still do. And you note that uh, we pointed out when we were speaking about his interview how he's completely assured and speaks with great confidence and flu flu fluency uh, all through his interview about everything, about his cities and his plans. But when he starts talking about reforming Islam, suddenly he developed this strange tick where he would <laughs> jerk his his head up like this repeatedly and uh i was thinking oh he's thinking about that sword going through his <laughs> neck uh because this is extremely dangerous ground that he's treading and it's not consistent as you noted you have quran only muslims it's ridiculous they're self-contradictory because the quran repeatedly says to obey the messenger how can you obey the messenger when the quran doesn't tell you anything about it how can you pray five times a day when the quran doesn't tell you to pray five times a day yeah. and you can just multiply problems that they will run into and the saudis aren't going to say you don't have to pray five times a day anymore they're not going to become quran only in that regard because then all these mullahs all over the country will say you are heretics you are apostates you were hypocrites and call for the death of mbs and all his supporters yeah well you've got two different groups that are really vying for power in saudi yeah. arabia you have the princes, what the 5,000 princes who control the politics, control of the running of the country. And then you have the brotherhood, the brotherhood of all these imams. And one of the things that happened in the 1700s, the Ibn Saud family, when they amalgamated with Wahab, they brought the two together. They brought the state and they brought the mosque together. Uh, well, we in Christianity separate church and state. That was brought together in 1700s and has remained intact for the last 400 years. 
with Wahhabism still percolating at the bottom here and Wahhabism that is then sent all over the world by missionaries and diasts. Uh, and we come across it in almost every country with all the petrodollars giving them their authority and their power, which is exactly in what, in some ways what MBS is doing. He is between a rock and a hard place, would you not say, uh, Robert, because he has to placate the Wahhabists, the, 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 the mosque, which gives him his clout. Uh, he, without the mosque, without the theological enterprise underneath, he is nobody in, in in the eyes of the Muslim world. And this little cross that was that was being worn by Neymar, I think is just the beginning of what he's up against. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you have, uh, I mean, you have the idea that, I mean, I'm still getting my mind around this, excuse me, that you have Wahhab, and he's being and an and MBS is being Quran only. Wahab wasn't Quran only. Yeah, he yeah. was uh, uh, very firm on obeying the Sahih Hadiths. Yeah. and so uh, how can MBS cut those out? And one of those is Jesus is going to come and break the cross. So if you don't, if you if you take that out, you could theoretically say that even though the Quran says they did not kill or crucify him. You can have Neymar wearing his cross because he doesn't, he's not a, a believer in Islam. And that seems innocuous enough. And yet there are multitudes of believers in Hadith who think that MBS would be a heretic if he throws all that out. And they forbid, that would forbid Neymar from coming into the country with his cross because Muhammad says no two religions. I'll drive all the Jews and Christians out of the Arabian Peninsula. And Jesus is going to come back and break the cross. There's no ground for MBS to stand on in the middle of all this. Yeah, it's fascinating because Wahhab actually is was was mimicking what Ibn Taymiyyah said in the 1300s. And Ibn Taymiyyah is the one that most scholars go to, uh, who created, who was the one that best best uh, uh, gave the idea that in order to be a good muslim you must read the quran and follow muhammad because the quran doesn't tell you how to walk talk eat drink and sleep you have to go to muhammad for that so read the quran and follow muhammad the book of the man the book of the man what, what well, i've been saying for years which was then repeated by Martin Luther uh, in the 1500s when he came up and said much the same thing about Christianity. To be a good Christian, sola scriptura, only keep with, with scripture and follow Jesus Christ, the book of the man there. Now, Wahhab in the 1700s then just took that idea from Ibn Taymiyyah and expanded upon it. But really, if you percolate it down, it's just the book of the man, the book of the man. Read the book, follow the man. In order to follow the man, you can't go to the book to follow the man because there's nothing about him. There's, he's only refer, referenced four times. Oh, over and over and over again, it says in the Quran, follow, follow Muhammad and, and the prophet, Muhammad and the prophet. But it doesn't give it a name to him. We only know that because Muslims have told us that that prophet is Muhammad. What's fascinating to know where the man is, you need to go to his biography, the Siddha. You need to go to his sayings, the Hadith. And then, of course, the Tafsir and the Tafik, which are the histories and, I mean, the uh, commentaries and the histories that unpack it. You've got to go to those traditions. MBS, by saying, we're going to go to this book only, he's pretty well lost the man. You can't have the book without the man. You've got to have the man because he is the model. He is the paradigm. He is, and I've said this to many Muslims, he is what we already have. They want what we already have. We already have our man. His name is Jesus Christ. And many people wear these um, these little band, these things around their wrist. WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's how we live. We live like Jesus lived. Where is Muslims going to get that? They only can get it from Muhammad himself. And so when MBS made that pronouncement, that uh, interview, uh, he threw out Muhammad out the window. Kept yeah. the book without Muhammad. You can't do one without the other. So can you? I can understand then why this is going to cause huge problems. I mean, what do you think is the future for uh, MBS and for this for these projects? One or the other has got to give. Either MBS will back down and affirm Wahhabism, or he will be killed and the Wahhabis will regain control, uh, or the Wahhabis will lose and Saudi Arabia will cease to be 
the kingdom of the two holy places. I mean, they might be there geographically, but it will not be an Islamic entity. But you cannot, he's, he's trying to walk a tightrope between the two, and he can't. He's going to fall off one side or the other. He's going to become Islamic or he's going to become non-Islamic. But to be semi-Islamic is what he's trying to do. It's never going to work. Not only you said he's throwing out the man and keeping the book, but Jay, he's not even keeping the book because as you noted, the book repeatedly says, obey the messenger. Mm -hmm. You can't do that by the book alone. Not only does he only is he only mentioned by name four times, but none of those four have any information about what he said or did or how to obey him. So there is just no way to fulfill the Quran's command to obey the messenger by holding to the Quran alone. And this is why Quran only Islam is a uh, essentially a pipe dream. It's in large part in the West, a fictional construct designed to give Islamic apologists a way out of having to explain and defend uncomfortable hadith and uncomfortable elements of the Sira. And other than that, it doesn't really have any life in the Islamic world. Yeah. And so there's no way he can build his entire polity upon it. It's, it ain't going to work. He's going to abandon Islam altogether, which I think is virtually inconceivable, or he's going to retreat, maybe not explicitly, but embrace Islam and force Islamic strictures on the new, uh, uh, the new cities and all that business, which mm. will significantly decrease their attractiveness to the outside world. Yeah, well, we're seeing maybe that first crack appear on August the 18th, or you might say August the 19th, when the reaction came, considering that little cross, that little cross, isn't it interesting? It's a cross that may be the first crack in the dam of this whole project. That Something little cross, block. the symbol, symbolism of, the symbolism there is not lost on you and me. We understand uh, that the cross has done a lot of damage all over the world and will continue to do damage. I want to end this off really by showing doing a contrast like we did with the last episode when you look at islam it it it, uh, it demands every area of life it is an encompassing uh religion it's not just a faith it's also a political structure it's as you said many times you made it very clear that islam is both faith and we're, we're, uh, faith and edifice. It's the mosque and the state that have been brought together. So every area of life is impacted by Islam. How you walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep is all dictated by these myriad of laws called Sharia uh, and the, the different schools of law that we have. The four major schools all show you how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep. So it is everything, the whole 24 seven wrapped up in one religion. Christianity separates the two and gives to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and gives to God what belongs to God. And that which Caesar does uh, is really much of the work a day thing that you see happening with the state, with policy, with pol uh, politics, also with policing and military and all the rest. The church on this side has a completely different remit. And you and I belong to the church. And our remit is to make sure that our your relation is a relational remit. We are to get people in relationship with God, which means we as Christians can really be involved in any state. We can be all in any country. We can survive. In fact, we can thrive even in an Islamic context. We don't impose a structure on the world. We bring a relationship with Jesus Christ to the world. And we go into every structure. It could be a Hindu, secular, humanist, Islamic, animistic, in any other structure that we come across, Christianity will thrive. And it will not demand that it changes all the structures. That's the beauty of Christianity. It can contextualize. And I find it fascinating when I look at Paul's writings, what he says in Ephesus, he doesn't say in Philippi. What he says in Philippi, he doesn't say in Corinth. What he says in Corinth, he doesn't say in Rome. He changes and ameliorates the gospel in every city with every difficulty that came across in those cities. But he didn't impose a law and institution like Islam does. There is no such thing as Sharia law in Christianity. We have a relationship, not an edifice. Islam completely start from the other premise. Can you see how it's starting to break down? And that's the beauty of Christianity. In so many respects, it will always thrive. It will always grow. You cannot shut down Christianity by imposing structures upon it. We live within those structures quite easily because all we need are two or three 
who worship Christ to find the kingdom of God. Our kingdom is where there are two or three uh, following him, worshiping him, and there Christ is with us, as Christ said. That's our definition. The kingdom of Islam is very much independent on making sure that no crosses, no little crosses are brought to the land of the two holy places. Terrific stuff. Thanks so much, Robert. You're always a, a treasure tro uh, a trove of information. You really have your finger on the pulse of Islam. You are a prophet for our day. I want to thank you for spending these minutes with us. I hope people are blessed by it. Now, people, you can react to it. Uh, and I, I've asked Robert if he'll look at the comments once we put this up. It'll probably go up this week or next week. And just look at the comments down at the bottom. React to the comments. Let's hear what you have to say. That's the beauty of YouTube. We need to be peer-reviewed. We want to get and see if you have a reaction to what's happening, not only in the news there in Saudi Arabia, but as you compare Islam with Christianity, you ask yourself, which is the more relevant? Uh, which is the one that you would rather belong to? Who would you rather follow? Muhammad or Jesus? Christianity or Islam? The choice is yours. God bless you. Terrific again. Thanks again, Robert, for being with us. This is Jay and Robert, over and out.